My name is Mark West, I'm from England, and I, but I live in Norway now. And I'm here today to tell you how I turned um, a simple Raspberry Pi Zero into a smart camera. And the Raspberry Pi Zero is one of these, a tiny little Linux uh, computer. But before I start, I've never been here before, so a little bit about who the devil I am. Um, I'm actually uh, an IT consultant at a Norwegian company called Buve, and there I'm working, well, there I'm doing a lot of hacking and a lot of making. I like to take real-world technologies, put them together, and solve real-world problems. So I like to mess around with new stuff and see, you know, find out how we can use it. I work mainly with Java. Um, recently, I've been starting up a data science department in my company. And um, yeah, I'm doing quite a bit of uh, AI and machine learning. And in my spare time, what's left of it, I'm an active member of the Norwegian Java user group, where I arrange, it's a little bit of a plug here, I arrange a conference called Java Zone in Oslo every September. You should check it out. It's really good. This is good as well, but like a Java Zone is also very good. So what am I here today to talk about? I'm going to start about talking about why I built the camera. What was my motivation for building the camera? And then I'm going to go on to tell you about how I actually put the camera together, the physical camera, the first version. I'll then talk about how I smartened it up using Amazon Web Services. And finally, we'll have a little bit of an evaluation about what I learned and some tips for you know, doing the same thing. But first, motivation requirements. And it says here, input from stakeholder, because I had a stakeholder. This was actually a hobby project that I did in my spare time. But I'm a father of two, happily married. And in anything I do, my wife is my project manager. So she was my stakeholder in this. And she's going to play a bit of a role in the story that I'm going to tell you. And basically what our motivation was, was, was a lot of people have been breaking in, or a lot of houses around us have been broken into. People were breaking in and stealing stuff, and it wasn't good. And we, we uh, hadn't been broken into yet, and we had internal security inside the house, but we wanted something that would kind of protect our garden, which is quite secluded, and tell us if someone was like hanging around that shouldn't be there. So my wife, the project manager, she works in the industry, and I, the developer, we sat down together and we drew up some requirements. So the functional stuff is simple. We wanted to monitor activity in the garden, and we wanted to send a warning when activity was detected, right? Simple. And a live video stream. That, that, it's a webcam, right? That's all it is. Then my wife steps in, the project manager, and she goes, get it done quickly, get it done cheaply, and that's fine. And then she came out actually with a, a good one, which was make it portable so you can move it around. Now, the thing is, my wife knows me. She knows that if she says, like, yeah, just take the time you need, then she won't see me for months. I will lock myself in the garage with my Raspberry Pis, and I'll have lots of fun. She also knows that if she says, use the money you want to use, well, you know, eBay, right? I mean, like, it's not going to be a good ending to the story. So she, she put these requirements on me. So the functional design is simple, a camera, looks for activity in the garden. When it detects movement, sends me an email with a snapshot from the camera saying, OK, there's something going on. That's simple. So then I sat myself down to build the first version of the camera, which was, as I said, a simple web camera. And I had to get the hardware first. Now, as I mentioned before, the camera is actually based on one of these. It's a Raspberry Pi Zero W. It's a little Linux PC with Wi-Fi built in. Now, this you can get for about $12, I think. But the problem is, if you're going to use it, you're going to need a power adapter, you're going to need an SD card, you're going to need you know, adapters for HDMI, adapters for the mini USBs. So you, you, might off, you might be better off buying a kit, like I, I've put up here. But it's up to you. It depends what you have lying around at home. But a kit will cost you around about 35 US dollars. The camera module, um, I used a Raspberry Pi camera module. And that's one of these. It's a tiny little camera. And it comes in two flavors. It comes in the standard camera and uh, a camera with um, no infrared filter, which you can use for night vision if you put it together with an IR light source. And that costs around about $33. I use a standard camera for my project. Then you're going to need to buy an extra adapter because the, to connect the camera to the Raspberry Pi Zero, you need a special adapter because the Raspberry Pi Zero is so small. And you'll need something to mount it. You'll need some kind of mounting thing. And in this case, I went for a zero view, which is a plastic mount. You stick the Raspberry Pi to that. You stick the camera to it. And then you just use these suckers to stick it to the inside of your window looking out. This is what the camera looks like from the front and back. And as you see, the Raspberry Pi, it's not much bigger than the actual Raspberry Pi. I don't have the, the mount with me. But you can imagine that like, it's not much bigger than that. 
And um, yeah, that's it basically. The, the cable going into it is a power supply. And that was the other benefit of having it inside. I didn't have to connect it to a battery. I could just connect it to the power supply from the house. So then I needed to program it. I needed some software. And as I mentioned before, time and cost were very important. Yeah, no, no, it's a blank screen. <laughs> um, time and cost were very important. So basically, I needed some kind of software that preferably would work out the box. So has anybody heard of Motion? Yeah, we've got some Motion people in the house. Nice one. So Motion is basically open source motion detection software. It's Linux compatible, and it runs on the Raspberry Pi Zero and gives you pretty good performance. Um, it has a built-in web server, so it solves that problem. And what happens is Motion will monitor your video stream, and when it detects activity, it will trigger an event. And you just connect that event to a bash script, which will then send you an email with a snapshot from the camera. So pretty simple stuff. And it works out the box. You don't need to do any coding apart from the bash scripts you have to write yourself, and no additional programming. So I'm just going to show you what the motion looks like. I've got two cameras running on the stage. If you could just turn the light up very quickly, because I don't have um, a night vision camera with me today, so it might be not such a great picture otherwise. Uh, sorry, uh, a normal Pi camera. So one of them is made for night vision if you connected it to an IR source, and the other one is made for, for normal stuff. And basically, you know, if I go and stand in front of the camera, I should like pretty, yeah, there I am, crazy English man coming up. So basically, this is the web stream from the two cameras, which you get just by configuring a couple of parameters. And you can see on the screen here, you see you have a little, this here you see you have, in the bottom left-hand corner, you have a unique ID for the camera. Uh, here you have a date and time stamp. I don't know if you can see where I'm actually pointing. And up here, you have like a little dash, and I'll talk about that dash in just a moment. But it's pretty simple stuff. You even have like another port where you can go and you can go through all the configuration parameters, list them out, and set them on the fly. So it's pretty good stuff. So if you could just put the light back down again. Thank you very much. So right, back to the presentation. So that's basically motion. And as you see, it works out the box. There's a very little, small amount of configuration to do with it. And basically how motion works is it's monitoring your video stream and taking each image and comparing it to the previous one and doing a diff. Simple. So if you have three images in a row, the first two exactly the same, no problem. But from image two to three, a nasty man has come into my garden, and that would create a motion event, which would then call the bash script that I've written and send me an email with uh, number, picture number three. And emails look like this. He says a dodgy man in the garden there, uh, running around in my garden. And what it does, motion, it draws a red box around the activity. And uh, basically, if you look up here, in that corner there, you see that number there? That's the amount of numbers sorry, the amount of pixels that have changed from the last picture to that one. So that's what's happening there. So pretty simple. Um, and my wife and I, well, I got this up and running, and um, it took me seven hours. So that was to, once I had the hardware in front of me, to assemble it took me 15 minutes, but to actually get the SD card, install Raspbian, install Motion, learn how to configure it properly, write the bash scripts, get everything running, took me a little bit longer. So about seven, eight hours it took me totally. And um, basically, we went on holiday, and we left that running for a month. And we got emails when the neighbors came into the garden to water the plants, or the, boys, the neighbor's boy kicked a ball over the fence and came together to get, uh, get it. So it worked. And we were very, very happy with ourselves. We looked at our requirements. And you know, we could say, yes, we monitor activity in the garden. We get a warning. We have a live video stream. I got it in place in seven hours. Low cost, you know, low, yeah, lowish cost, and portable. So. We were really, really happy. We had the glass of wine and like patted each other on the back, and we were like, that's a successful project. And then the false alarm started coming in. Now, there's something about you know, Oslo, Norway. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of old women with cats living around us. And um, the cats like to congregate. They like to use the toilet in our garden, which was great, because I got an email every time a cat took a shit in my garden. I got an email when clouds moved across the sky. I got an email when shadows moved across the terrace. I got emails when it rained, and the rain dripped down in front of the camera lens. I was getting 250 emails a day. That wasn't very successful. And you know, 
it made the camera completely worthless because who is going to go through 250 images you know, or 250 emails, right? You just end up filing them away with all of those Jira emails you get and just ignoring them, right? And the problem is motion is great. You get a lot of free stuff, but it only cares about the amount of pixels that change from frame to frame. It doesn't care about why. It has no intelligence. It's an idiot savant. So that takes me to the next part of the talk where I added AWS to the camera to make it smarter. And basically, what I have is a problem. I have all of these emails coming, but I have no filter. So what I need is some kind of smart filter. A filter that will say, cat, that's not interesting. Or, oh, there's a person that is interesting. And then make a decision on whether to send me the email or not. So I went to my wife, the project manager, and I said, oh, um, I would like to make a change request, if I could. And um, she said, well, what, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to change this parameter here. So instead of sending a warning when activity is detected, I want to send a warning when human activity is detected. And she goes, oh, right, okay, interesting. She goes, how long do you think that will take you? And I was like, a week? And she was like, a week? Uh, well, you know, are you sure? Can you not do it in like, you know, four days? And I was like, yeah. So there I was. I did not know how I was going to do this, and I had like four days. Problem. <laughs> so I started scratching my bald head and trying to think through, okay, what will I do? And the first thing I thought was, all right, OpenCV. Um, this is about a year and a half ago, and OpenCV ha has like facial detection. I thought, okay, I'll use facial detection to find out if a person is in the snapshot. But then I thought, yeah, what if the person's not looking at the camera? You can't see my face now, right? Or if they've got their face covered. Then I thought about TensorFlow. Build a neural network. Cool. I mean, like, let's face facts, it's a great excuse to have a lot of fun. But building a neural network is going to take time. If you haven't done it before, you have to train a network. You can use pre-trained networks, but you still need to put something on top of that. And it's going to take time, you're going to make mistakes. And in three or four days, I'm not going to get it done, to be perfectly honest. I have a full-time job as well, I can't just mess around with this. I wish I could, but like, I can't. So, yeah, so it was a fun project, but it would take more time than I had available. So. Okay, I was left in the wilderness again. Blank slide. I was left in the wilderness again and like um, thinking about what I would do. And then like I had, I just read about it and I thought, okay, I'll try this. Amazon recognition. AWS stands for Amazon Web Services. I think probably there's some people here who have worked in Amazon who are, who, or are working in Amazon because I've heard that there's an Amazon office nearby here. But anyway, Amazon recognition. Uh, AWS stands for Amazon Web Services. So Amazon recognition is part of recognition suite of cloud products, or services, as I say, and it gives you in an image analysis as a service, offering a range of APIs, so you can do different kinds of stuff with it. And this time, it only had like still image analysis, but now it has video. It's built upon deep neural networks, and it was launched in November 2016. So alternatives to recognition, of course, because I am not an Amazon evangelist. Alternatives are things like Google Vision, Microsoft Computer Vision. There's also like other products like Clarify that do the same thing. So there are alternatives to recognition out there, but I chose to go with Amazon because I wanted to learn AWS. So I'm just going to show you recognition very, very quickly. And like what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my browser. I just have to find it here. There we go. It's tiny. There we go. Back. Right. So if I go to recognition, now I'm going to show you a demo of how it works so you get an idea of how I used it. So I'm going to upload my own picture of the burglar that you saw earlier on. So the picture's now been uploaded and processed. And what's happened, if you can see on, the, on your right-hand side, you can see a bunch of results. Labels have come out with confidence scores. This is where we see that AI or machine learning isn't actually that smart. Because like it says, oh, is it art? Is it modern art? It's actually improved because the first time I did this, I actually thought this was a selfie because it's holding a selfie stick. That is, a, that is a true story. You look at old videos of this talk, and it did that. Anyway, but like, no, it manages to find this a, a person, human, you know, pretty good, even though the confidence scores aren't that great. Let me just show you a quick another uh, example, just to give you another idea of how it works. Hmm? Yeah, well, you could say that, yeah. Here we go. Here's another picture of me with a wig on. So, human, person, 99%, 99.2%, you know, it's pretty good. Afro hairstyle, 78.6, hair, which is great because I don't have any. Um, accessories, yeah, so I think it's, it's actually smarter than I, th 
than you might think because I think it, it classes the wig as an accessory. So it knows that this is a wig. So it's pretty cool anyway, but that's recognition. And you can imagine like, you know, it's pretty simple when you've got that, just adding it to the solution is easy enough. So you've got recognition. So where before you had the camera that just sent an email, the camera now can maybe call recognition and then decide whether to send email or not. But the problem is the Raspberry Pi Zero is very constrained hardware. And I do not want it waiting for responses from Amazon, either synchronously or asynchronously. I don't want to do that. So I thought, okay, what will I do? All right, why don't I just delegate it all? I will now have the camera just do one thing, or basically it will be a camera which forwards still pictures to the Amazon cloud when it finds a per or when it thinks there's motion or movement in my garden. And then the Amazon cloud will do two things. It will use recognition to analyze a snapshot, and if it finds a person in a snapshot, I will get an email. Simple stuff. The reality is slightly more complex. Um, this is the flow, so I'm just going to go very quickly through the services I'm using and explain in what order I'm using them. This is probably the ugliest animation I've ever made, but like, um, it, it, it kind of does the job. So what happens is the camera uploads a picture to S3. S3 is Amazon's uh, simple sort storage service. It's a data lake. You can put anything in it. And basically, when the image is uploaded, S3 kicks off a trigger, which is a Lambda function, a piece of code, and that trigger calls a step function. The step function is actually a workflow which orchestrates the rest of the process. It calls recognition, analyzes the picture, and if it finds a person, I get an email using the simple email service. And on top of all that, I'm also using Amazon Web Service Identity Access Management. You have to use that. When you have all these distributed services, you need to make sure they can't call stuff on each other they're not allowed to call. So you need to use AWS IM as well. So I mentioned Lambda functions, and I use Lambda functions to implement all the units of code in my solution. And uh, you know, basically, Lambda functions, you can write them in anything, more or less, these days. Uh, you can write them in Java, C Sharp, Go, Python, Node.js. I've actually implemented my camera in both Java and uh, Node. And they're serverless. I mean, we all know what serverless is now. It's the big, hot thing. Um, you know, your code is running on servers, but you don't have to manage them basically, right? And it makes everything very scalable. It makes everything very uh, available. And yeah, it's just brilliant. Lambda functions also have a pay-as-you-go model. So you pay for every time you call them, and you pay for the memory resources you consume. So like you have a fixed cost and a variable cost, depending on how, you know, how, how much memory they use. But you have this really big free tier. So if you're using Amazon, if you're using Lambda functions, and you're using less than 3.2 million seconds a month, of, of CPU time and 128 megabytes of memory, then you, then you get all that free. So 3.2 million seconds a month is quite a lot. Um, if you double the amount of memory to 256, then you get half the amount of free usage before you start paying. But anyway, what it means is you can play around with it a lot before you start paying anything. And also Lambda functions give you access to the native SDK, so you can, you know, you can use Lambda to glue your stuff together. I'm just gonna show you very quickly Lambda. Um, are we, do we have any Java developers here? Oh, two guys, no, three, hey, four. Right, okay, I'm just I'm speaking to you guys now. Um, now, basically, I'm gonna very, very quickly show you, I don't wanna use a lot of time, but Lambda functions are small, discrete units of code, so you shouldn't use them to implement, you know, like, stateful stuff. They should just be like, do one thing and do it well. So, basically, I, I implemented a whole raft of Lambda functions, and I'm just gonna show you some, Java code is by nature very, very verbose, um, much more than it needs to be, possibly, but I just want to show you how quickly you can implement one. So basically, I've created a, a, a simple Java um, class here that look, basically is, it calls, lamp, it calls recognition for an image. So basically, it's very, very simple. It takes in a list of parameters, which is a Java class which is serialized from adjacent objects. It um, also has a context object, which is like runtime context, which tells you things like, you know, where you're running and that kind of thing. So the first thing I do is I use the context object to get the logger, a login object, and log uh, what's coming into the function. I then um, create a recognition client. I create a recognition request. I call the service. I take the results and transfer them back to the parameters object, log the parameters object, and return it. So this is, you know, I don't want to spend a lot of time because this is trivial stuff. And if you actually go to the Amazon site, there I am again, handsome guy. 
Um, and then you go to the Lambda console, you can actually look at all the Lambda functions you've created. And you can filter them. So if you want to filter them by runtime, you can filter them by runtime. And these are all the Lambda functions that I use for this project. And the first one here is the one that I've just shown you, the Java code I just showed you. And I'm not going to go use a lot of time on this, but what I want to show you is how you can configure it. So you can configure the timeout here, if you see where I am now. And um, Lambda functions have a maximum timeout of five minutes, which is why you should not be uh, doing stateful stuff in them. And um, you can s the memory can be everything from 256, or 128, sorry, all the way up to 3,008 megabytes if you want to. Um, it all depends what you're doing. I have it on 256 because Java is memory hungry. And you can even do things like testing from here. So if I open up an, an event, for example, here is a JSON object which will trigger the Lambda function. This JSON object here has a reference to an image that's been uploaded to S3. That's basically what it has. And when I trigger the Lambda function with that, it will be turned into a, in, into a Java parameter and the code you saw will be called. And if I just run it like so, just very quickly, and test it here. So you can actually test your Lambda functions from the console. And you can also uh, go into your logs. Everything is logged in something called CloudWatch. So if you have any problems that you want to debug, you can actually go in there and find them. Now, it seems that Lambda functions are running a bit slowly. We'll give them a couple more seconds. Oh, we didn't want to run by the looks of it. Let me try them one more time. But anyway, what should happen here is that I should get a, a response back from uh, recognition. I think I have. I think it's at the top here, yes. So here you see the, the uh, output from the recognition or from my Java uh, code which has like uh, all of the labels with like confidence scores next to them. And you also have like logging, as I mentioned before, in like uh, CloudWatch, so you can go in there and mess around with that. Okay, so that, this is trivial stuff, right? It's very simple, you just write a Lambda class, or sorry, a Lambda function, upload it, and off you go. But you need something to, because Lambda functions aren't, orchest well, they're not uh, stateful, you need something to orchestrate them. You need to put them into some kind of maybe a workflow or a state machine. And that's what you can do with Amazon Step Functions. And they basically allow you to orchestrate your Lambda functions. And they're relatively new as well. And they're also, well, they're defined by JSON files, which means you have to define states and then your transitions between the states. And you have to write that as JSON. And then you upload it and you get a nice little visual representation back, which I'll show you in a moment. And they give you the same benefits as Lambda functions. State, um, so they're serverless, sorry, and they're scalable and that kind of thing. This is what the lem uh, Lambda function, or sorry, the step function looks like. This is what you get back. And you see here it's quite you know, trivial what's going on here, quite simple, but I'm going to step through it. So the first thing that happens is the picture is uploaded to S3, as I mentioned before, which will result in this being activated. Okay? The first thing that happens is that uh, we have a Lambda function I just showed you sends the image to recognition for processing. The second step is another Lambda function that takes that result and then compares it against the blacklist to find out, okay, are the labels here indicating there's a person in the garden? The third step is not a Lambda function call, but it's just a decision point in the step function, which is looking at the output from step number two. And um, if the output says send an email, yes, we send an email using uh, another Lambda function call and the simple email service. And then we archive the image back into S3. So we move it away from the upload directory to an archive directory. And then, of course, we have an error handler. If we have any unchecked exceptions here, an error handler, which is another Lambda function call, will send me an email, via, once again, via the, the simple email service. So pretty simple orchestration. And you can make much more complex orchestrations if you want to. So before I do a demo, I'm just going to say that, like you know, I mentioned before, I had four days, three, four days to put this together. I had never, and this is God's honest truth, I had never, I didn't even have a developer account on Amazon at the start when I actually decided I was going to use recognition. I didn't have a developer account. I um, set up a developer's account, spent quite a bit of time on Stack Overflow, as you do, um, and um, you know, I put together a working prototype, not exactly what I'm showing you now, but a working prototype in the, case, in the, in the state of a like, case of uh, three days. Um, and that was not three work days, but three days once you got the kids to bed and you know, once you've done the washing, you know, using that time in the evening to work on the project. So what was really good about this is that I had low, uh, uh, not much time 
not much money, but I was able to put stuff together quite quickly because it's like Lego bricks. So the smart camera demo, right, okay. What I'm going to do now is I could ask you to switch the light on again. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by activating the, um, the motion detection on both my cameras. So I do that from the console here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to try and actually trigger the camera. And then just see how it works. We'll can, we can actually go through the, um, the step function just to see how it works. Section starts. Right, so both cameras should now be theoretically activated. Right, I'll just zoom in a little bit to both of them. So you see there's a slight different color on them. And that's, as I said, because one of them doesn't have an IR filter on it, basically. So one of them's got more of a kind of a purple color to it. I was hoping he was going to walk past, but no. OK. <laughs> um, right, so what I'm going to do now is you can see look like it's running away. So I'm just going to go and like uh, wave in front of the camera. You might see me coming in now. Here I am. Bald English man. I'm here to steal your stuff. Right, and off he goes. Now, of course, real criminals don't do that. <laughs> It would be good if they would, wouldn't it? You know, it's like, hello, here I am, take a picture of me. But, like, unfortunately, they don't. So what's happening now is the pictures are being uploaded to S3. And um, what will happen is once they're uploaded to S3, they will be picked up by the step machine, run through the step machine, check to see if people are in there. If it finds a person, then I'll get an email. Hopefully, I will get an email. So let's see. Now, these are other emails that have nothing to do with the... Uh, that. I was hoping the emails would come already. Sometimes they take a while because like, um, it normally takes like a minute for like, you know, the whole process to go. And sometimes, very rarely, when I'm doing a demonstration, it decides not to play. Okay, so we have human, 98%. People, 98%. Word. I mean, maybe it's describing the tags here. Or maybe it's just really cool and saying word. I don't know. I don't know. Um, that's a 90s joke, sorry. Um, beard, face, portrait, furniture. That's not bad. If I look at the other one that came in, word again. It must be, it must be these here. Yeah. The tags. Poster, face, human, person. And that was a bit less sure, 51%, because it's a blurry picture. But you see, it works. Now, of course. It could be that it always happens, right? Every time something goes in front of the camera, you always get a picture. That would be you know, cheating, of course. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try it. I'm going to use my high-tech test rig. I'll just make sure that these are still running. Yeah. Right, I'm going to use my high-tech test rig to try and trigger the camera with like, something which isn't a person. And my daughter, is, she made this, and she's so happy because I've taken this literally around Europe. This dinosaur has been around Europe with me. Um, so right, OK. Let's try and see what happens now. So we're seeing now the, uh, yeah, the Hollywood special effects. This is the magic happening, people. Rawr. Rawr. Right. And that's going. Now the pictures are being uploaded. And once the pictures are uploaded, I want to go back and look at the step function. So while we're waiting for that picture to upload, I want to show you the step function for the other one, the one where I got the email. So if I could just show you that. Uh, just, I don't need to open that, actually. I'll go to my other Gmail. Here we go. So we go to the pictures that we saw earlier on. This one here. I have a step function ID, which I can then use to show you the step function execution. So this is a step function execution which resulted in me getting the picture, right? This is the positive one. So what we do here is we just zoom out, and we go to this. Uh, so what you can do with state machines or the step functions, you can actually go in and you can, um, you can look at all of the old um, executions, and you can step through them, and you can see the parameters that are going through them. So here's that step function execution that resulted in me getting an email last time. And you see green, that means it was executed. So you see here the recognition call gave me an output saying some labels here, person, beard, and whatnot. And then the next uh, step function step, set alert to true which ended up resulting in me getting the email because like, the make alert decision then just piped the flow to the send notification and archive. So if I then look at the latest step function execution for the dinosaur that I just showed you, and I can just show you again that I haven't got any new emails, nothing up the sleeves, so uh, no more emails. So if I show the latest step uh, function 
execution. Have to zoom out again. Yeah. We will probably see here, I hope, yeah, that send notification wasn't triggered. So if I just zoom into that a little bit more. So we'll see here, if we click on the uh, recognition image assessment, oh, I'll have to zoom out, sorry, because otherwise we can't see the labels. If we click on the image recognition step, we'll see the output from this was, for the dinosaur, furniture, logo, door, trademark. So it didn't, it didn't see a person there at all. So what I've done today, what I've done really is I've just hacked together a solution of things that weren't supposed to work together and got them to do something kind of cool. Could you just put the light off again? Cheers. So, we're, so there you go. That's where we are. Let me bring that back up. Okay, so what did we learn from this? Or what did I learn from this? Now, as I mentioned before, I started this project with no prior knowledge of AWS. And I'm not an AWS evangelist. I've looked at Google stuff. I've looked at Microsoft. And it's just as simple. You just plug stuff together. And kind of what's cool about this for me is that the idea that you can use machine learning in your applications without having to build neural networks, without having to be a data scientist. You know, you can just be a developer and, you know, basically do things like image recognition, speech processing, text processing, just by using machine learning as a service. Now, going back to the project, my project manager, she was happy. You know, she, she got everything she wanted. She was happy. And um, the other thing was that, like, we could look at recognition and think a little bit about what did we learn from recognition. And Amazon recognition, it gives you consistent results. It really does. Uh, they change a little bit over a long period of time as the model becomes more refined that recognition uses. And it successfully handles, like, bad images, partial images, motion blur, that kind of thing. And here's an example, actually, this one here. This is actually me. This is a reflection from the window into the lens. This is me turning the light off in the house, just about to go to bed. And recognition like processed that picture and said, that's a person with a 99.14% certainty. So it just goes to show that you can, you know, recognition can work quite well with like, uh, low quality pictures. The best thing about it is no more false alarms. I, I get maybe two or three false alarms a week because recognition isn't perfect but it's really cut down. You know, from 250 a day to two or three a week is pretty damn good. But recognition isn't perfect. No machine learning image processing solution is, to be perfectly frank. Number one, recognition is a black box, it's a service. Right? So you don't know what's going on inside it, you don't know what labels you'll get from it until you've actually tried testing it. You can't give it feedback, so there's no reinforcement learning involved. It struggles with noisy pictures. And here we have another example. My little girl sitting on a rock in the Norwegian woods, and it can't see her. And when I tested it, I, I, I couldn't get Google or Microsoft to see her either. And the other thing to remember with like, things like recognition, the results will only be as good as the pictures you upload. It's like any, any, anything, garbage in, garbage out, right? I mean, this is, we all know this. So my hit hit rate for actually successfully detecting people is between 80 and 95. And you can actually affect that. You can, you can actually um, affect that hit rate if you want to. And to explain how you do that, I'm just going to go back to talking about motion. Because motion, what it does is when it detects activity, it creates, a, it creates an event with a timeline. And on that timeline, you have multiple pictures. So you can actually tell motion, which of these pictures do you want to upload? And it's like a fixed setting. So once you set it, it'll always be that kind a picture that's uploaded. So you can say to Motion, I want to upload the first picture of each event. And that's no good, because if it's just the tip of my foot coming into the screen, that's not good enough. You can tell Motion to upload the image with the most pixels changed. But that's no good if I've just put my hand over the camera. Right? You can tell Motion to upload the picture with the most central activity. But if in my garden I have one of these, or just a, a table or chair in the middle of the garden, and I'm doing this, that's no good. You can alternatively say to Motion, just upload all the pictures. But that is going to have an effect as well, because basically, if you upload one snapshot, you'll have a lower cost, because you're piping all your stuff through Amazon anyway. <coughs> you'll have a lower hit rate, but a lower cost. If you send many images through recognition and the Amazon infrastructure, you're going to have a higher cost, but a potentially higher hit rate. And the thing is, it's not either or here. You can actually configure Motion in different ways to affect how many images you upload for each event. There is way, tricks of, for doing that. 
But it's something to think about. You know, if you're building a camera or any kind of solution like this, how critical is it that it gets 100%? Because you know, if it's going to be, if you need to get a higher amount of like, uh, if you need to get a higher hit rate, you're going to have to pay more money if you're going to use this kind of solution anyway. The monthly costs, that's important because when you're using Amazon, you have to pay a monthly cost. Now, when I first started using Amazon a year and a half ago, when I built this camera, look, uh, then I paid like about $5 a month. And the reason for that, for the same amount of pictures, the reason for that was that I got a lot of free stuff. And like Amazon, they like to give you the first shot for free and then start charging, right? So after a year, the prices go up. But as you can see from here, the majority of the prices, the majority of the cost is the recognition. So the first year, I got, I think, 5,000 images a month, three. But after those 12 months expired, now I pay, I think I pay a dollar for every 1,000 images. So uh, approximately that anyway, not, not quite that, but yeah, maybe a little bit more than that. But yeah, it's approximately a, a dollar for a thousand images. So you know, it kind of, it makes a difference if you've got a lot of images going through your solution. So you need to think about this. Before you start building these solutions, you need to look at the costs. What's it going to cost you in the long term? Because it might be cheap now for the first year, but after a while it might cost more. And that's the cost per month. This always comes up. You know, has it caught any real criminals? Well, yes, it has. Um, I was really, really lucky because when I created this uh, solution, I blogged about it, and it, the blog got picked up by Hacker News, and it went from like I went from like five blog readers to like fifty thousand. It was like crazy, and um, somebody in America of all places, in the U.S., he implemented my camera, and he was sitting in a lecture. He's a student sitting in a lecture, and uh, somebody tried breaking into his his apartment, and he got the email. And then he looked at the, uh, the web stream, and he sent it to the police, the IP address for the web stream, and they just rushed to his apartment and addressed the, uh, arrested the criminal. So it actually yeah, has caught, to my knowledge, one, <laughs> one criminal. Yeah. Uh, but yes, so that's quite good. Next steps. What do I do now? Well, I, you know, I have a solution that works, but I've, I've been thinking about version 3 of the camera, and I have two ideas. And this one is the more likely idea. OpenCV, since I think 3.1 has added support for deep neural network models. So you can actually take your pre-trained CAFE, TensorFlow, or, uh, or, 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 or Torch model, and you can actually embed it into OpenCV, which gives you a lot of possibilities. And it has been proven to work on the Pi 3, but the performance is pretty damn bad. So I'm going to need to do some tweaking and you know, do some, do some, take some steps to make it all work the way I want it to. Another option is that Recognition Now supports video. So you can actually stream in the video to Recognition using Kinesis, for example, and then have that, you know, doing your kind of like uh, your um, image analysis, but, you know, or your video analysis, but that's going to cost you a lot more. You get like a, a thousand minutes of free, vi free video a month for the first year, but a thousand minutes of video won't go far, to be perfectly honest. So, you know, I think I'm most likely going to go, I'm looking actually going this direction. So it's going to be interesting to see, and maybe I'll come back another time and like present the next step in the camera. If you'd like to know more, I'm going to put these slides out on Twitter within 10 minutes. Well, we'll have the panel, I think, afterwards, but it'll be during the evening. I will put the slides out on Twitter. Um, I will also have a link to my uh, GitHub where you can find instructions for creating a similar project. And also, my GitHub has links to blog entries describing the project. Uh, I just will point out that the GitHub is no longer actively supported because I was getting people, get, people were getting angry at me because I wasn't like, uh, implementing their use case for them. But uh, yeah, this is a hobby project. <laughs> so there you go. Um, with that, I think I'm done. So. Thank you very much for choosing my talk at the end of the day, and thank you very much for your, your attention. Cheers.